This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Um, so seeing the presence of a quorum, I'm calling to order this meeting of the Regional School Committee um, at 6.35 p.m. and I'm going to immediately move um, that we enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective, collective bargaining or litigation with the APEA. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares, and I do declare, with intention of returning to open session. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald, seconded by Spitzer, and we'll take a roll call vote. Um, please state your vote when I call your name. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger? Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. Thank you. And we will now um, move to uh, executive session. Um, I will uh, call the meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order, um, and we'll take a roll call um, attendance. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Oh, did we lose Ms. Lord? Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Um, McDonald present. And um, that is quorum, so we are in order. Okay, and I'm I'm just realizing actually we don't have a quorum yet. Mr. Mino what had has not joined yet, right? He didn't jump on earlier. Okay. So Pelham does not yet have a quorum. I know Ms. Kenny is not coming right now. It's just me and Ms. Barlow. Um and I have not heard from others that they were not coming. Dr. Morris. Yeah, so my recommendation is, you know, since the first order of business is um, public comments that, uh, you know, with Ms. Hall's permission, you may be able to start that process and when a third member, oh, never mind, I will be quiet. All right, All right terrific. Seeing the presence of a quorum at, I'll call this Helen School Committee meeting to order at 7.15 and we'll start with roll call attendance, Ms. Barlow. Okay, and I'm, I'm just realizing actually we didn't have a quorum yet. Mr. Mingo what had, has not joined yet, right? He didn't jump on no, it. Yeah. does not yet have a quorum. I know Ms. Kenny is not. Manino's here. You have four. Yeah, I, I'm hearing an echo. Is that? Oh, okay. Maybe not anymore. Okay. Um, all right. Sorry, I didn't hear your response, Brenda. Did you? Barlow present. Okay, great. Mr. Menino. Here. Menino here. Ms. Dancer? Dancer present. And Hall present. All right. Sorry about that. Thank you. That's fine. Okay. So um, our first order of business is public comment, and we have um, a, a lot. Um, I'm going to start with the, the voice message um, comments while I get the written comment um, queued up. Hi there, my name is Bennett Hazelope, and I'm the parent of an Amherst Middle Schooler and Fort River Elementary student. Um, I'm only calling today to say that as we return from the distractions of the holidays, not to mention major political events that have rightly absorbed so much of our attention, we need to remain laser focused on finding a way to build on the positive momentum from the recent APEA school committee meeting. Having viewed that meeting, I feel sure that there's a way forward. And for the sake of our kids, our families, our teachers, and our community, we need to find it fast. Thanks to both the teachers and the school committee for remaining focused on this important job. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Nick Spire. I am an Amherst resident, and I have one child at Fort River and one that we had to withdraw from the district. You have heard from our family previously, and I intend to keep my remarks brief. The closures of schools continue to be irrational and uninformed and deeply unfair to our students and families. The school district made a grave and easily foreseeable error in entering the current memorandum of agreement with the APEA and continues to propagate that error 
by not doing everything in its power to return students to school. The APEA has behaved petulantly in its refusal to revisit the MOA. There is blame to go around. As a parent with children in both private and public schools, the stark difference between what young learners receive in an in-person versus a remote environment is deeply saddening. The private schools don't have any more space or more money per student, and they are not being reckless with safety. They are trying their hardest to do what's right by kids, which is a whole lot more than can be said for Amherst Regional Public Schools. This injustice has been going on for far too long, and just because some families have gotten used to it does not make it acceptable. Please reopen schools without delay. Thank you. Good evening, this is Stephanie Hoffman, a resident of Pelham and a parent of an 8th and 9th grader. I'm leaving this voicemail for public comment at the January 12th school committee meeting. I appreciate that the APEA and the school committee were able to gather for a transparent, trust-building meeting. I hope that discussion will continue to create a plan for safe reopening of our schools for this spring 2021. Many of our students are suffering due to remote learning. Although most teachers are doing their best to engage students and provide instruction, our students continue to fall behind. Their time on instruction is less than any other years. Their learning from other students through normal classroom discourse is absent. The students are suffering from social isolation, lack of engagement, and a continual decline in the desire to learn. Parents, guardians, and teachers try daily to encourage engagement in students, but nothing can replace the learning social and emotional development and overall happiness gained by in-person instruction. As schools all around us are able to safely open and medical professionals continually show that schools are not super spreaders, it is important to act now. Time is of the essence. The detriment to the emotional well-being of our students is more important than the low risk of contracting COVID when safety measures are in place. Like so many parents, I implore the APEA and social school committee to actively engage in a dialogue and create an immediate plan for the safe reopening of our building. It's time to take advantage of all the hard work completed by our facilities members and all the PPE purchased and, and put our students back in the classroom. It is time to put aside differences expressed in the past and put scientifically based metrics in place for return to in-class learning this spring. It's time to consult with experts such as the town health director and those with knowledge, training, and expertise to make the appropriate call for in-person learning. Parents want to support teachers in the schools, but without a plan of action to get students in the classroom this spring, many parents... Sorry? ...will look for other avenues. If the APEA and school committee cannot show collaboration and a goal of in-person instruction for students and create a plan in the very near future, parents will continue to lose faith and trust in the ARP system and seek other options, furthering the decline in enrollment and increased budgetary constraints. I sincerely hope that the APEA and school committee will continue their open dialogue and allow all parties to the education system, educators, staff, administration, school committee, parents, and students to voice their needs. These conversations and decisions should be completed imminently. The students are our future. It takes everyone's actions and desires for civil discourse and our focus on putting students first that will allow the trust in the system to continue and parents to send their schools to the Amherst Regional School District. Thank you. This is Elena Davis calling from Amherst. Uh, I'm calling to encourage the Amherst School Committee and the School Administration to persist in finding some creative solutions for returning our students to in-person learning. As a parent to students being educated in the district, and as a professional who consults with many other districts in Western Massachusetts who have figured out this process, I have been discouraged by the lack of flexibility demonstrated by some of the players involved. I remain an advocate of public education, and I'm hopeful that a reasonable renegotiation of the current MOA can be achieved. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Ellen Boucher. I'm an Amherst resident and a um, mother of a 
Wildwood um, kindergartner and second grader. And I just wanted to take a moment to first thank the APAA and school committee for the meeting um, last week. I thought it was really productive and heartening to see both sides come together and build trust. And um, I just want to um, encourage everyone, all sides, to continue to work for um, you know original creative solutions to figure out a way of safely reopening our schools. I think it's it's really imperative that we find ways to get students back into the classroom and make sure that we're doing it safely. So thank you. Hello, my name is Matt Wagner. I live in Amherst, Mass. My daughter goes to Fort River. She's a current first grader. I'm just calling to once again encourage the school committee to do whatever they can to get kids back in school as quickly as possible. Um, the kids uh, need to be in school. The science shows that kids can be brought back to school safely. Almost every other town in the Commonwealth is doing it, um, as well as around the country. Um, and uh, our child is lagging behind. Um, so whatever the school committee can do to get kids back in school, I think they need to do it. Um, and I encourage them to do their best to do that. Thank you very much. Bye. Are folks seeing my screen? Okay. Um, so this, uh, this public uh, comment document is quite long. Um, it's about, I think, 30 pages. Um, and it will be posted on the agenda's webpage in the morning. Um, I apologize, it did not get posted today. Um, but uh, for folks that are having, you know, want to follow along at home, um, this will be available um, in the morning online.
as I mentioned, um, that uh, document will be posted online on the arps.org website on the uh, regional school committee agendas page. Um, our next item uh, is approving of the minutes. Um, and I'm going to point out that, that what's in our agenda is actually incorrect. We, do, we did not and have not seen yet um, minutes for December 1st, 15th, and January 5th. Um, that, was, that was just last week. Um, but we do have, um, and I'm going to pull up the, um, we have September 22nd, September 29th, October 6th, October 20th, and then the three November dates. Um, the November date that says November 11th in the agenda, it actually was November 10th. We did not meet on the 11th. We met on the 10th, so that was an error. Um, so um, for folks watching at home, um, the, the school committees received these, um, all of these agendas that I just listed um, a week and a half ago. We discussed them at our last week meeting um, and changes and any revisions were emailed to um, Ms. Sharkis, who kindly helps us with um, minute taking. Um, and what's in our packet now reflects um, any um, comments and revisions that were sent to her um, within the last week. Um, so tonight, um, rather than going through um, each individual one, unless there's a glaring error that somebody noticed that didn't get into the updates, um, I would accept a motion to approve the batch um, in one, one swoop, uh, for region, sorry. I move that we accept the minutes listed. Um, that. For the region, yep. For the region. Yes. And I will, um, I'll second that. So um, moved for the region by Stancer and seconded by McDonald. Is there any further discussion? Ms. Seeger. I. Uh, yeah, I'm just noticing my name isn't on a few of the meeting minutes from, it looks like November 4th and November 10th uh, as being in attendance. I believe those were included the regions, so I'm just double checking. Oh, so um, uh, Ms. Sharka just commented that she these she did not send the updated versions yet. So these are um, is it, is that correct that these are the unaudited? I believe Ms. Kenny had a bunch of edits. Did she? She's not here tonight. Um, I might suggest that we table this and come back to this at our next meeting then. Um, so as a reminder for anybody who is noticing edits in this packet, um, uh, please do email Ms. Sharkis. Um, today is Tuesday. If you could email um, uh, by Thursday, um, then we can be looking at that. Um, would, would that be enough time, Ms. Sharkis, for getting them into the packets for next week? Yeah, that's enough time for me. Um, if you could actually send them by tomorrow, just because I'm not going to be here this weekend, that would be great. So by tomorrow. Okay, super. Um, so we will now move on to our next um, item, which is a superintendent's, uh, whoops, am I on the right? I'm on the wrong page, sorry. Yes, it is the superintendent's update. <laughs> sorry, yeah. Dr. Morris. <laughs> no, that's okay. I was gonna say, um, if there was something else that you wanna do, that was fine too. But um, so I actually have quite a few. Um, so I apologize, even though we met just last week. Um, so as you know, the budgets have been frozen except for essential purchases in all three districts. And um, you'll get a uh, second quarter just ended uh, for us 12 days ago uh, or 13 days ago, but uh, we continue to be concerned about the budget. And so on Friday of last week, we did inform our AFSME cohort, which is um, custodians, man, van drivers, maintenance staff, um, that we would have to look to furlough uh, while schools predominantly remain closed. Um, so we do have some 
UFCW food service workers who have been furloughed since the beginning of the year, as you're, you're aware. Um, and so we'll just keep you up to date, but I did want to let you and the community know that, um, you know, it's, it's not something, it's a, probably the least fun thing, you know, or at least in the thing that we like doing the least in terms of the HR department and myself. But when we've looked at the fiscal realities this year, particularly in some of our districts, um, it, it is the case that you know, we, we are going to have to adjust that, um, adjust our budget and also adjust that it looks like we will be in remote for some time. We have been, and you know, if that changes, we will um, adjust those furloughs. But at the time being, we are um, starting to work with, you know, as, as we typically would with the bargaining members and the leadership of the bargaining. Um, but since that email went out on Friday and there's more follow-up today, um, just wanted to communicate that. As always, we start with voluntary furloughs. Sometimes our staff, particularly with the unemployment benefits, uh, as part of the Second Cares Act, um, for a whole variety of reasons, who may be interested in voluntary furloughs, um, but that's that's the way we've approached it with other bargaining units, and and we're at the place where we have to talk about that with AFSCME as well, or or in the process of. Um, on a more positive note, um, we got last week a Project Red grant of two thousand dollars that's going to supplement the food service um, program that we're uh, running. That is services, you know, serving um, hundreds of meals uh, every day. And so thanks to Project Bread, thanks to Michael Gallo O'Connell, who is the facilitator, the food service uh, school nutrition coordinator or director, excuse me, uh, for doing that application and Shannon on the business office who processes that all. Um, third thing is just thanks to Doreen Cunningham, as well as the team who put um, the anti-racism curriculum together. Um, so that's, uh, we're, we're getting that um, going in Crocker Farm, and then we'll expand that to the other schools. It's intentionally an iterative process so that as teachers are interacting with the curriculum um, and working on it, that it can be improved and, and over time. And so we really thank the team that uh, Ms. Cunningham brought together in the summer, as well as her leadership on it. And I know it's one of the things that was high interest in the community of getting that going, as we said, at the elementary level. Uh, Crocker Farm had done some work last year with an external consultant uh, so they felt very, you know, primed to get going on it, but it'll go through all the schools throughout this year. Uh, and again, in a, in a way that we're going to get it field tested by our staff uh, and improve by the end of the year. So we're ready to go full school, full, you know, with everybody on the same piece, uh, on the same page next year. Uh, but tremendous amount of work went into that. And just want to thank folks who, are, who worked on that. Uh, as you might have seen, there's a... Um, the state came out with um, some support to get started with pool testing um, of students and staff members. We're already we're approved and have access to Binex uh, antigen testing. Um, that was a webinar today for about an hour and a half, along with Robin Supernot, our nurse leader, as well as Faye Brady. Um, you know, I think I got some mixed feedback from Desi whether our current distance learning model was was the right model for pool testing, just because it's so small and. There's not a lot of close context because everything's individualized, but we're gonna, you know, keep on following up with Desi, see if they will approve us uh, to at least, you know, perhaps start a pilot of it. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it was the sense I got from the call is much more directed for districts that have more typical learning models in place in their schools uh, with more than one-to-one, -one, you know, an adult and a kid uh, in a room each or some version of that. So remains to be seen whether Desi will approve us to be part of that program, but just wanted to pass that along as well. Um, River Valley, uh, so we got a couple grants that are uh, required as part of the grants to hire consultants around mental health um, supports and River Valley is working with us. They're, they've been uh, partnered with us before and we're working on trying to get in-person counseling available for students uh through river valley so thanks to them we're also looking they're, they're working with us on trying to find bilingual staff members who can provide that service for families and students who are interested so i'll have more soon on that but that's been a really nice partnership to get going um uh just uh amber school committee meeting up because it's a joint committee uh just a review for people who didn't watch the meeting last week that um uh, the district asked for three different enrollments one that was um, the 600 student enrollment that had been talked about a lot in the last couple of years. One, uh, Fort River enrollment, Fort River only enrollment, and then one that was in between that would have had not exactly the same, but roughly equal size schools and it involved in addition to Crocker Farm. MSBA only approved um, two possible pathways to study. Uh, one was to look at um, Fort River only. They sized it at 320 students based on capacity in the rest of the district. And then one was a 575 
uh, K to five school option that would um, take Fort River and Wildwood offline um, and have sixth grade go to the middle school. Um, that has now been submitted uh, and approved. We also submitted additional forms uh, that they require that um, just confirming that the town council has approved the funds uh, for the feasibility study. Everything's in and this afternoon I get confirmation that we are on target for uh, moving forward to the next MSBA board meeting, which is February 11th. Uh, at that point, we'll move into hiring an OPM by we being the building committee. We'll look to hire an owner's project manager. Um, they have that slotted um, to perhaps come to completion in June or July, because um, that has to be approved also by MSBA. And uh, based on their schedule, they said, you know, sort of if, if you're ambitious, you get to June, otherwise you get to July. Uh, but that would be the next step in the program is is a multi-month process to hire an owner project manager so we'll keep you up to date but the good news is we are moving forward uh, i think i mentioned this last time mspa said you know it's slower and more expensive than everybody thinks it should be and that's true of everyone's experience in the mspa process so i'm going to say that every single time i give an update because i think it's the best advice they've given me and they encourage me to say it as often as possible um that's a lot of update. I have more, but I went on that pause. I see a hand up, uh, if that's okay with the chairs. Since one is eating, I'll just assume <laughs> that role and uh, call on Mr. Demling, if that's okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, so yeah, I bring this up because it's a joint Amherst and Pelham meeting. So, um, so related to the MSBA update you gave. So two options that were approved. One is a K to five option and one's a K to six option. And so, Clearly, depending on what the regional school committee and the Amherst school committee decide um, with regards to sending sixth grade to the middle school or not, um, that that then um, defines what option is is viable going forward. Um, so I, I think I believe we we discussed at the end of that Amherst meeting um, the the therefore heightened urgency or or priority for um, finishing the discussion that we started a year ago. Um, of exploring six to the middle school. And um, I understand we have a lot on our plate right now. <laughs> we have a very aggressive late start that you're probably gonna update us on the whole of it. Um, and, you know, in person at all. Um, but if you could just maybe talk about what you think broad strokes is, is a reasonable timeline um, for finishing that work. Uh, I'm hoping that we can finish it like this, this school year. Um, so that we can give the town of Amherst, um, you know, the parameters it needs to to know what's what's viable going forward. But um, interested to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think the report is mostly done. What what's not done is the engagement. You know, so what you saw and when I presented, what people on those committee or the Amherst school committee saw um, at the regional committee when I you know submitted my artifacts over the summer was a mostly completed report without a huge component, which is the engagement. Uh, my recommendation, and I've talked to the chair of the building committee about this, is, uh, you know, I wonder if the school committee and the building committee can actually work jointly on that engagement. And I agree with you that this spring was not too soon to, to get started. Um, I think it, it would really bring together people who are going to be charged with two different decisions, but, but they're interrelated decisions. Um, and I think if we can get the broad swath of the town uh, you know, um, there may be different constituents that want to be involved in that. I think it's good because they, you know, you can cut it a million ways for me. It, it, they still need to come together with a decision that, that relate. And I'm not trying to relinquish, you know, or take away the school committee's authority on this, but um, I think it'd be really good for the building committee at least to be aware of the dialogue the school committee is having instead of to be completely ships passing at night. Um, so my recommendation is that I love to, task people with things, I suppose, in these meetings, I'm starting to get better at that, is that I wonder if Mr. Harrington, uh, Ms. McDonald, myself, and and uh, the chair of the building committee at some point can sit down and, and talk and try to figure out what that might look like. Um, but, you know, in terms of the data and the report, it's pretty much done. It's really the part that wasn't done was the engagement and an executive summary. But, you know, that that's relative to the, the full report that the committee, I thought, did an outstanding job on that. Um, I want to be really clear, clear too, that like I am not at all, uh, you all can say, you know, the things that you want to say. For me, I'm not saying sixth graders should or shouldn't move, um, but I think it's really about the process and the engagement at this point. Uh, I think Mr. Menino may have a question about that, so I see his hand up. Yeah, and then I have a question too. Mr. Menino? Well, when will the town of Pelham get a chance to express its position 
on the movement of uh, sixth grade to the middle school. Yep, so here's how I would sequence this. I think unless Amherst chooses to send its sixth graders to the middle school, there's no conversation for the small towns because it wouldn't, it just doesn't make sense either space-wise or logistically to send 16 students, 16 sixth graders to the middle school is just a non-starter. There wouldn't be a program for them. Um, so I, certainly the town can choose how much they want to engage in this in the front end, but until Amherst makes a decision, there is no decision for, for Pelham, Leverett, or Shoe Fair to make because logistically it doesn't make sense. So, you know, uh, the soonest, Ron, that I could say that this building project, because you're, you're a member of Pelham, you're not in the region, the soonest this building project, in the best case scenario, everything works perfectly, there's kumbaya in the world, and we get there, it would be the fall of 2025. So, yeah, there, there's, you know, I, I think there's a, there's, on the Amher side, in my opinion, there's some urgency that I'm feeling and hearing because it, it's, there's a fork in the road coming, and one of the forks involves sixth graders going to the middle school and one doesn't. Uh, but from everybody else's end, there's a long time between that decision gets made in a building process and when, you know, uh, potentially a new building would be built that would, would force that decision to be realized. Does that so, help, Ron? Yep, helps. So I'm, I'm just going to um, jump in and I'm speaking with my hat of the regional school committee chair on, not the Amher school committee, because I'm going to duke it out with the Amherst school committee chair on this. <laughs> um, but, but seriously, I'm speaking as the region uh, chair. The decision, as I recall, about sixth grade to the middle school starts first with the region. Um, that the region has to make the decision about from pedagogically um, is 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 this what we want our middle middle grade education to look like um, and that and that's a decision that lies first and foremost with the region regardless of any sort of building project happening in Amherst or Pelham or anywhere frankly um, so it's not that I'm objecting to partnering and 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 with the with the building committee on it. I but I don't see. I, I think we we need to have a conversation about it because it's 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 awkward, right? But just from a from a decision making process, there's no decision for Amherst to make until and unless the region decides mm -hmm. that we'll take sixth grade. Yeah. Um, no, you're, you're, I totally agree, and we should put that on an agenda to come up sometime soon on the region. I, I think that's yeah. that's really helpful. Thank you, Allison. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this? Okay, so I'll move on with the uh, update. Um, I want to thank our nursing staff. Many of our nursing staff were given the opportunity to volunteer this week in the um, regional vaccination site for first responders um, at the bank center here in Amherst and, and many of our nurses participated and they're doing the incredibly important work of um, a couple hundred people getting vaccinated. Uh, those who are actually they themselves can get vaccinated uh, mostly towards the end of the week. Um, but just want to thank our nurses for volunteering. It was all day yesterday. It's four to eight. So it just ended tonight um and um, it's not just for the town of amherst it's actually for you know we're us in northampton are the sort of the regional hubs for the area for first responders uh tremendous amount of work and thanks to emma dragon and her folks at the town for their work um good news on distance learning center the state inspection i got word this afternoon was passed so they'll be looking as soon as possible to uh, get um, they being the amherst recreation formerly lsc to get their um second set of students in and they're working collaboratively with our team on that so um, good news all around on that one the next four town meeting will be on february 6th nine in the morning um, we'll be talking about the regional budget uh, we'll have more information we'll have the governor's budget uh, by then um, so people can mark their calendars for that and that was sent out to all uh, members of you know elected officials in the member towns uh, someone queued me up earlier um, late start um, so we have another meeting with union 28 later this week we've met as an administrative team multiple times a smaller group like a sort of task force uh, and we hope by thursday to be sending out an email about engagements uh, multiple layers both um, large group engagements for family staff and middle school high school students smaller group engagements uh, further on in the process uh, a clear survey with a binary choice um, 
So we are working towards getting a recommendation to you the last week in February um, for your consideration. We, I think we, we feel good about mapping that out. We can certainly talk about that if this, you know, one of the regional, actually maybe it's a joint meeting, but next week, but uh, we do want to engage all of our stakeholders in that, including, you know, focus groups like BPAC and CPAC uh, and others, but we want everyone to be able to get engaged and we're trying to work on a very finite slide deck with the right amount of information because uh, you can get lost in the research on this um, even though it's very clear um, and, and the implications. So I think in general we're trying to get a core issue is we're not going to, as I said last week, we're not going to have all the questions answered. We'll have some, um, but does the community want to make the change? Because I think if the community commits that they think it's best for kids, we can do the other piece as well over time. Uh, if the community feels like there's too many barriers, then so be it. But that's our goal is to engage the community. You know, there's in reading about, I'll just mention not just Northampton, but there's, you know, eight Metro West districts a couple years ago that also changed their start times. We are not, you know, it's been done in Massachusetts. We are not trailblazers on this one. It's whether wh whatever we think is best for kids, uh, knowing that nothing will be perfect and nothing will will not there'll be unintended consequences of keeping our same schedule that we've had previously and there's unintended consequences of changing it and and what do we think is in the best interest of kids second to last is we got some unfortunate news that the swimming pool in belchertown is now closed because belchertown's in the red and their health department has closed their swimming pool to high school students so for two weeks um so we are scrambling try to figure out what we can do and do I was involved in some advocacy this afternoon um, that we are not Belchertown High School. Um, so it's not run by the school department, it's run by the town rec department. So that's making it a little more challenging of who to contact and how to advocate around that. But just wanted to share that and I'll hopefully have an update that's more positive next week. But that's where we are as it relates to swimming. Um, the I had a conversation just before this meeting started with Desi about the waiver request and um, how to meet the four you know the minimum number of hours for Amerson Pelham where we applied for the waiver. It was a very positive, productive conversation. Um, let me know that some of the way we've been coding things, you know, we could have been more generous to ourselves in terms of what counts as synchronous time. It does not only screen time; it could be work that's assigned as long as it's brought back to um, and discussed by a teacher. So. Uh, we're meeting tomorrow morning trying to resolve that one, but um, it was a very helpful conversation because it's a little different analysis than what we had previously. And I want to end on the positive one. So thanks to Todd Fruth, who works at our uh, Summit Academy and our high school. He organized students uh, for last weekend, the first ever virtual cabaret. They performed students performed solos and duets of popular songs and musical theater numbers. Uh, pretty cool, um, January 9th, um, and it was just shorter given the, you know, virtual nature of it, but, you know, just wanted to end with just thanking our staff for being so creative and still making sure that students are able to perform, albeit in different ways, uh, in this time. So thank you, Todd, and thanks for your department for always being creative and figuring out ways to get students in the front and center. So, um, that is a very lengthy update. I apologize for the duration. Any uh, comments or questions from any of the committees? Uh, 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 since Peter went first before, I'll start with um, Ms. Spitzer at this time. All right, um, thank you. And I apologize for kind of, you had a lot and I have comments on multiple <laughs> headings. So I don't know if it's easier to like give you the first, like do it one by one, give you a chance to respond or just try to get it all out there. Um, so I guess one of my questions was, Number one, thank you to everybody involved in the vaccine efforts, especially our nursing staff. I think that's wonderful news. I was just going over kind of the phases, and I was reading that some of the, um, you know, independent therapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech and language therapists performing work in the home are actually listed in phase one. So I'm wondering if there's anybody else within our um, school district who might actually qualify for this phase one. I know we're starting off with the with the first responders because within the phase or levels of phasing, it's it's complicated, but it, that was one question. Um, and then the other question goes to a totally different topic, which is the late start time conversation. I'm just wondering if, I guess as an elementary school parent, I, it's not actually gonna be a later start for any of the elementary kids. It's gonna be an earlier start time. And I think if we're talking about community engagement and communication around this, I think it would actually make sense to say change in start time 
because it's not going to be late for everybody. And if I'm listening to this conversation, I think it's good to be upfront that this is going to be different depending on where you sit in the community. Um, so just kind of a suggestion as we're putting together those planning resources, I think that's really important. Um, and then I guess the, the final question that might be, um, I, I didn't get to ask because we got started talking about, um, it might have been lumped into your first one, was just asking about the expansion of um, the distance learning centers. So I think that's great news that we have expanded, Amherst Recreation has been able to expand. I guess I'm curious about like, what are the constraints on us going even further? What would the district need if we were going to serve more students in those um, distance learning centers? And those are the three, thank you. Sure, so the second one is a great suggestion. So it's not a question. So I just accept it as a, a helpful uh, suggestion. On the first one, my understanding is that um, school staff, outside nurses, um, are in phase one. Even the nurses, I believe, are only in phase one if they volunteer for the to to, to help with the vaccinations. Um, and, you know, I, I will say uh, I could go too long on this one, but uh, the I feel like it's 1776, and we're not a country. When I talk to people in other states, I have a colleague in a neighboring state who is a college professor who's getting vaccinated tomorrow because that state has decided educators pre-K through higher ed to be in phase one. Someone else I know who is vaccinated in New York state but works in New Jersey and the spouse should have been able to be vaccinated but the state boundaries prevent them from being vaccinated um, even though by the rules of the employer they would be. So all that to say, um, it's incredibly frustrating uh to see um how the rollouts went and i don't mean locally i think everyone's doing a phenomenal job um i do think you know and i had a, a meeting where we got an update on this i do think a month from now you know systems and infrastructure will be built up um, i think we'll see a rapid escalation in the number of vaccines given um you know and i want to be as i always try to be in these times uh humble about that but but i think your frustration of not being like me not really all of us not having clarity is a huge problem. And the time frame of February to March is still being repeated by the state for where educators fit in phase two of, um, of the rollout. And I'm just hoping that perhaps when we get to a certain date next week and there's a different plan at the federal level, maybe we'll see an impact at the local level as well. And the last question was on distance learning centers. So right now, the only one we're running ourselves, as you know, is for intensive special needs students. And so if we chose to expand that, you know, instead of relying on our partners, but actually, you know, self-fund that, it would be a financial commitment that we would be making and that money, you know, would have to come from somewhere, but there's nothing that would prevent us from expanding or running our own distance learning center uh, on, in addition to Mark's Meadow and Amherst Recreation or a distance learning center of their particular focus, like ELL students or something like that. Um, you know, it, it's a it would be a financial commitment that uh, we'd have to make, but there's nothing that I see as a um, barrier to that other than the finances and finding the people to do, willing to do it. Mr. Demling? Yeah, uh, so plus one of Ms. Fister's suggestion to call it change and start time. That's a really good catch for half the people. <laughs> um, my, my question's on um, planning for next year. So we most of the public comment was about in-person for right now, but we did hear some about people um, planning for next year and how that affects their near-term decisions. Um, so just real quick, could you just confirm, so the current MOA expires on June 30th. Could you just confirm that that's correct? That uh, and correct. also, um, when when do you think we'll be, when do you anticipate that we will start in earnest talking about our in-person in -person posture for, for the fall and what our approach to all that is gonna be? Um, I'm not blaming us for not taking up the discussion yet, given everything that we are currently discussing, um, but just to you know give people a heads up about what the um, timeline is, thanks. I don't think, I think it's about slotting it in the schedule, you know, uh, in your schedule. I mean, not your personal schedule, but in the schedule of the school committee meetings. Um, but uh, I know it's on people's minds. I've heard that too. Um, so, you know, I think it's, the hard thing now is, you know, it, it's, 
it feels far away. I know it's not in reality. Um, I don't see a lot of districts talking um, that far away. And I think, um, but you know, it, there's nothing preventing you you all from having the conversation sooner as opposed to later. Mr. Menino. I'm not sure I understood your answer. Uh, basically, I want to know when will we know whether there will be in-person learning in the fall? Uh, that's a planning process. W when are we going? When? Who decides? Uh, uh, is there another negotiation, another memo of understanding? Uh, when will we know? I, I think uh, I'm not trying to be coy here. I think that that's for you all to determine the timeline by which you make decisions about that. So you're saying, well, I'm not on the regional co committee, but I'm on the school co Pelham School Committee. Uh, how would a member of the Pelham School Committee start the ball rolling to discuss in-person learning for the fall? How, uh, what pro what procedures will, would a person follow? So there's two options. One is that you could put it on a Pelham School Committee agenda by emailing the chair and myself um, so that you could talk about it in Pelham so that the regional reps from the town of Pelham could take that and bring that with them to the regional because the region is the negotiating agent. Or you could reach out to one of the two, not both, but one of the two uh, Pelham members uh, of the regional committee and share your opinions with that person. Thank you. Um, not to not to jump the gun for any other questions from um, from any committee members, but um, uh, in in my update, I'll be talking about the the next uh, agenda planning for the next regional school committee, and I believe that we do have um, conversation on twenty one twenty two planning for on on the draft agenda for next week. Um, so. Are there any other uh, questions or comments for Dr. Morris? I'm seeing none. Okay. So we'll move on. Um, and I believe, yes, the next um, item is a chair's update. And I um, will be brief, but I, I have a couple things. Um, so uh, as, as many people uh, may have read in the in the Gazette uh, this afternoon. Um, the the article wasn't completely clear, I don't think. But um, the key point is we we received an email from the APEA Executive Board yesterday evening, late, indicating that they um, uh, they they do not have a mandate from their membership to reopen negotiations on the MOA. So we um, are back to square one on that. We are not um, proceeding on that. Um, they also indicated that their membership strongly supports in-person learning for intensive needs and preschool students at this time. Um, and they shared with us a proposal, um, also known as a side letter, um, with, uh, that describes requested conditions that are in addition to those conditions that are already um, agreed to within the MOA in order to make that happen. Um, the Regional School Committee is reviewing that, and um, so we'll, we'll um, uh, be progressing that, but we do appreciate that um, that offer um, and um, proposal from from the APA Executive Board. Um, uh, we heard in public comment several uh, commenters commented about our meeting uh, last Thursday, the meeting of the Regional School Committee with the um, Executive Board of the APEA, um, and we do have two more meetings that are uh, of these informal discussions scheduled and on our calendars. Um, the next one is this Thursday at 5.30 p.m., um, same bat time, same bat channel, the following week um, on Thursday, uh, whatever that, uh, uh, 21st. Um, so two, two meetings on the calendars for those. Um, and as I just mentioned, the Regional School Committee is meeting next week, and I guess it's TBD whether we want to make that a joint meeting. Um, but right now it's the Regional School Committee meeting Folks can email me with um, agenda questions or ads, but right now what's drafted um, in that agenda and you know subject to change um, is a budget update on Q2 for this year, um, school calendar, vaccine update, 2021-2022 discussion, 
including late start, um, virtual and in-person learning calendar and structures, um, access testing and, and um, attendance and distance learning update. So that's all in store for um, next week. Any comments or questions from Um, Chair Hall, do you have an update that you want to give for the Pelham School Committee? I don't. Thank you. Um, great. So uh, moving on to school committee announcements. Are there any announcements from any other school committee members? Uh, Ms. Stancer. Um, there will be a budget subcommittee meeting tomorrow at 6.30. Ms. Lord. Yes, the School Equity Task Force has um, sent out a survey and we do apologize that we did not translate it ahead of time. If you have families that need it translated, is there an echo for you? Oh, maybe, okay. Please contact me at lordh at arps.org and I will do my best to get it translated to whatever language our families need. Thank you. Any other announcements? Is there any update from our um, reps on the JLMSC? Okay. Not seeing any, so um, we can move on to our next item of business, which is new and continuing business, um, talking about uh, spring 2021 in-person planning. Um, and to kick that off, I just want to say um, this is an open discussion. The regional co school committee has been talking about this. We wanted to bring um, uh, uh, jointly the Amherst and the Pelham school committees together with, with the regional school committee to can you continue this discussion. And it really is open discussion and ideation. We face multiple challenges. I'm sure um, that's not news, but it, just to recap, we continue to hear from families about their need and their demands for in-person learning. And as we heard tonight, their frustration that we haven't found a way yet to make this happen is growing. Today's news about the APEA decision to not renegotiate the MOA is certain to add to that frustration and impatience. We're hearing directly from educators also that they are interested and willing to return to in-person instruction if enabled to do so. Um, we also received um, a proposal from the APEA board to enable that in-person instruction on a voluntary basis for our um, pre-K and intensive needs learning center um, students. Um, we've begun, as I just mentioned, those informal discussions with the APEA. These are not MOA renegotiations. And I know there's, there's some confusion, but those, these are not negotiation meetings, they're um, discussions. And all of us expressed at our last meeting our commitment um, all, all around the room, the table, the, the Brady Bunch squares, um, to working to, for students um, and, to des and a strong desire to develop flexible solutions to better support their learning during this pandemic. So balancing all of those needs is really difficult, and, and especially when we, we know that uh, negotiating the MOA is off the table again. Um, so this discussion is really to talk about how do we get there and, and get there quickly so that students are able to return to in-person learning this school year. So I open up the floor for comment, discussion, ideas, concerns. Ms. Spitzer. I just want to say that I'm very heartened by the last um, last week's conversation on Thursday. I want to thank um, Ms. Cunningham for, for leading us in that conversation and for the APA for joining. And while I think there's a lot of work to be done, I'm also heartened by the suggestion that we prioritize the pre-K and the ILSC students, um, the intensive learning students. So I, I'm, I just want to acknowledge the the potential here for potentially some progress, but I also simultaneously want to acknowledge that I'm, I am, you know, 
I, I think we want to keep moving because <laughs> we need to make sure we keep momentum. And I think I'm, I'm hard, you know, I'm glad we have these two meetings on the calendar. And I, and I think it's really important that we keep up the momentum and we keep thinking creatively. Um, in particular, and I just want to say, like, focusing in on these most vulnerable students, so the youngest among us and those who have difficulty um, accessing remote learning. Um, but I'm, I'm really curious about what others think, because there are a lot of people on this call tonight who haven't um, necessarily been in some of the other conversations we've been having. Mr. Denley. Yeah, so I do have a, um, a motion I'd like to um, submit to our committees for consideration. Um, I sent this out to um, everyone uh, earlier today after we got the news um, about the um, the MOA negotiation decision and also the uh, the uh, the letters about uh, volunteer staff. So um, it's it's somewhat long, um, Chair McDonald. I don't, I don't know if you'd be able to. Um, to, to share that on your screen, um, uh, you know, uh, so I, I, could, I could, uh, so while you're bringing that up, I can sort of talk about what it is and, and what prompted it. Um, okay, so there it is. Um, so it was prompted by, by two things. Um, so one is the, is the response today, uh, from our request from November 2nd, um, that, um, the APA is, is not um, in a position to renegotiate the MOA at this time, which um, is, is obviously difficult news and, and, and makes it harder to move forward with in-person learning. Um, and, um, and it was also prompted by uh, the, the, the update that we got from our chair um, uh, earlier uh, a couple of days ago, that um, a number of staff over the last days and weeks have, have reached out saying that they would be open to a voluntary return. Um, and then we, we got the, the notification today that most of pre-K and ILC staff are open to a voluntary return. And so um, what, this, what this is essentially is um, saying, let us go back to in-person learning um, starting next month, starting in February, uh, with staff who voluntarily choose in-person instruction. Um, for as many students as possible within the safety guidelines we have, right? So keeping the, the distancing and the masks um, and obviously limited by the, um, you know, staffing availability. So prioritizing our higher need students, um, making sure the superintendent manages any shift back to remote learning based on a continuous assessment of health conditions and in consultation with local public health officials. Um, and then to work in close collaboration with APA leadership um, and getting input from the school committee uh, and student families to, to implement the plan. Um, you know, I mean, I, I have a lot more I could say about why I feel like this is the best way forward now, but um, at, at the end of the day, it's, it's a pretty simple idea, which is we know that we have a clear and urgent need to provide in-person learning for a, a number of students and that we're not able to do that right now. Um, and so if there are staff who are willing uh, of their own volition to uh, to teach in person, you know, let's 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 make that happen, and let's make it happen in the most expeditious uh, manner we can. So, um, it's more I could say, but I'll I'll leave it there for for um, for anyone who has has thoughts on that. Mr. Menino. I approve of the motion. I will vote for it if it's presented. Uh, but practically, what if a English teacher decides to volunteer in person? How does a student get back home in time to take a math course that's only offered online? Mr. Demling? Yeah, so um, I think the devil is in the details in a lot of this. And I think. Um, it's intentionally vague um, as an instruction from the school committees to the superintendent about implementation details. Um, you know, clearly, uh, you know, we're not gonna get 100% um, voluntary participation and within the current bounds of the MOA that we have, that's okay. You know, I think like, staff uh, are well within their rights of self-determination under the current MOA to, to be teaching remotely. Uh, based on what the metrics are. Um, you know, this would be 
um, you know, how can we staff um, based on uh, based on those staff who are are uh, uh, voluntarily uh, open and willing to teach under the conditions that the superintendent sets. Um, I, I'm sure that that will lead to, um, you know, a certain number of staff uh, for a certain grade, and there will be, um, you know, those kind of imperfections that, that we'll have to um, smooth out, right? And so it's not gonna be perfect. Um, I just sort of, my way of thinking is that I balance the, the pros and cons against what we're currently doing, which is quite inequitable <laughs> and quite imperfect. Um, and so uh, it's, it's I, I think of it as trading one set of inequity and imperfections for a different situation. And what are we gaining? What we're gaining would be a whole lot of in-person for a whole lot of students um, in, in a way that completely respects staff autonomy. Um, and um, when, you know, given the news that the, the roadblock now we have with, with changing the MOA, um, I, I feel like this is, this is a practical plan B um, that, that can move forward in, in, in the, the, the quickest way uh, possible. That's the other thing that's really driving me here is the time urgency, right? You know, our school year doesn't go for the next 60 months. <laughs> it goes for the next like five-ish months. So um, kids are really on the clock and particularly for kids who uh, have gotten not much or nothing at all from remote learning, um, every day that goes by you know, is, um, is, is important. And so that, that's, that's the other thing that, that I think procedurally makes a lot of sense with this approach is that um, it doesn't get bogged down in let us negotiate all the particulars of conditions for every subgroup of student, right? It just says here, superintendent, find out who is willing to come back under the appropriate conditions that you set in consultation with public health, health officials and, and, and let's get this going. Mr. Manion? Menino, did you have a follow-up? I find Mr. Demling's comments compelling, and it would also be a signal to the community uh, where the school committee stands with respect to in-person learning. So I support the motion, or, or the proposed motion. Ms. Hall. Uh, I also think, you know, given a really challenging situation, um, this is a, an imperfect but practical and I think really important proposed solution. It won't be ideal, but nothing is. Um, you know, to to think that it's possible that without this, we could be at a point where kids could go potentially into the fall without being in person um, is just horrible to me. Um, I also like that this um, shifts the kind of the oversight of this to the superintendent. I think the superintendent has proven that he really focuses on what the public health indicators are and that we can trust him to um, look really carefully at what the experts are saying is safe and not be left up to you know, someone like me, I, I certainly am not, but I think that he knows the right experts to talk to, to make sure we can do this. Um, so I also support this um, very strongly. And I think it's actually incredibly important to make sure that we can get as many children in schools learning in person as possible. Um, and I think that we can do that safely. I think I, I would like to, we, we talked about sort of the conversations that we've started having with the APEA executive board and, and, and those have gone, I think, we all came away from, at least, sorry, I should say we, the regional school committee, and the, because we have um, members on, on this call that were not part of that, that conversation, so I apologize, but I think we, we all walked away with a, a feeling of, of sort of shared direction and shared interest. Um, and, and I, I really do appreciate the, the proposal um, and the quote unquote side letter that we've received from, from the APEA um, uh, to provide uh, in-person learning for our highest need and highest priority students that are really truly suffering. All students are suffering to a greater or lesser extent right now in, in extended remote learning, but really working to get sort of those priority students in. Um, 
and and I would look forward to sort of this, you know, it's a creative solution around our around um, the sort of what's become sort of an intractable situation with our with our MOA. And I and I see this as a as a creative solution as well. That's sort of in the spirit of that um, that voluntary return for the pre K and the ILC students. Um, so just extending that that solution um, or potential solution to even more students. Um, so I also would support this. Ms. Barlow? Um, I'd also like to share my support for Mr. Demling's proposed motion. I think it builds upon the side letter and it makes a lot of sense. And I think it'd be um, important for us to respond to all these public comments by trying to find a way to come together to get students in school safely. Other thoughts from folks that haven't had a chance to speak yet? Ms. Dancer? So I know that Mr. Demling made this very general, but my brand can't stay out of what might be potential details. Um, I like the idea, but so let's say you're in the middle school and you have half of the team members who are willing to come back and teach and half of them aren't. I mean, this, uh, there's, there's a, it's maybe not the reason to not support the attempt to do this. I just think that we may be putting a huge load onto the superintendent at a time when he already has a lot on his plate. I haven't made up my mind yet whether I would vote for this or not. Mr. Demley? Yeah, I mean, it's an excellent point and it's it's absolutely a huge ask of the superintendent. And, um, you know, if were we to pass this tonight, I would expect the at our next meeting, the superintendent to come back and give us the biggest reality checks of what we're asking for. Right. Um, I mean, I, I certainly would expect that there are going to be some buildings, some grades, some programs, because we talk about pre K and ILC, by the way, right? But we have a number of specialized programs um, that are, are in that high needs category building blocks, Summit Academy, Ames, PIP, uh, you know, let's list, list go, list goes on in addition to our, our, our other priority groups. Um, so there's going to be uh, cases, you know, um, where where we don't have enough staff um, to to uh, meet the in-person um, requests from parents, uh, and and that implementation, you know, if were we to go ahead, will be imperfect, and in some cases, it 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 could be inequitable. I don't think we should shy away from that, and so I, I balance that against what we have now, which is no in-person. And, and and a host of inequity, right? I, real, I, I really think about like the, the low-income families and the students on IEPs and the students who are struggling emotionally. And I, I kind of balance that. And, um, you know, we, we, if, if this is asking the superintendent to implement a, a, a perfectly equitable solution, then we should not pass it, <laughs> right? We should do this with eyes wide open, that this is a very challenging situation um, we are, you know, coming off a, a, a really disappointing result with, with knowing that we aren't going to be able to move forward, changing the MOA, uh, and we have some time left. And so what is, what's the best shot for getting some level of in-person, right? And I, one of the comments from the 30 something pages of comments we got tonight that really stuck with me was that gentleman who said that even if his kindergartner got one, one day, <laughs> they would be elated. Right, and so I, I think of like, well, what if, what if the high school, you know, eventually ends up that they get a half a day, you know, for one or two of their specials or something? I don't know. You know, this is the kind of thing that I would expect the superintendent to come back and reality check us on. Um, I, I think I, I would be okay with that because we would be doing the best we could, and we would be able to tell the community, right? We would be able to honestly and authentically tell staff and parents, look, we heard you. Um, we weren't able to change the MOA, but we did the best we could that, that honors staff autonomy to the help. 
um, to to provide as much in person as, as we could, knowing knowing that it it it's not going to be um, perfectly and equitably um, perfectly equitably distributed. So, kind of babbled there, but <laughs> I hope I can address that. Ms. Hall, um, I, yeah, I also think that I mean things are certainly challenging now, and asking Dr. Morris to implement this will be a challenge, and I don't mean to be flip about that. Um, but we are in for really, really serious challenges, no matter what, whether we do this and the challenges in the immediate term, or if we don't and huge numbers of families leave the district and then we have really serious budget problems, or if there's even more loss of learning to deal with, especially with the students that are most harmed by remote learning. So I just don't think there is a way to do anything in this situation that avoids challenges. Um, and I, I have to wonder like, if the issues that we create would actually be worse if we don't do this. Um, so, I mean, I, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to like, I'm not the one who would be doing that specific work. And so I don't mean to undermine what that would mean. I just, there's no easy way, but I think not making a decision in, in the immediate term like this is just going to push most likely bigger problems down the road. And those won't be able to be dealt with with a single motion or, you know, a few weeks of a lot of work if families just bleed out of the district and then we can't fund programs. Mr. Harrington. Yeah, so kind of in, in reading this and kind of digesting it, like I'm, I'm reminded of the fact that we're kind of here because some folks decided to vote for us because they wanted us to kind of represent them. And and I'm, I'm also cognizant of the fact that, that we provide a certain degree of like leadership in the district. I, I feel like this right here is probably, it, it's the, the best balance we're going to get right now, right? Like this, it's there are definitely going to be inequities but less so than there are right now i feel like that we are underserving a certain population this is prioritizing it we've heard from the apa leadership that that's what they want to do too that this is this is a, as good as it gets right now i think I, I mean i don't i'm trying to look at it from every other angle trying to look pessimist optimist but i, I feel like this is as good as it gets right now so long as it's it's not too much of an ask, I guess, for the, the superintendent. Like we would definitely support, right, in any any kind of way we needed to. But yeah, hey, I'm glad you you said that, um, Mr. Harrington, because that's been, sort of been what's weighing on my mind. Um, and it's it's really really challenging. Um, it, you know, we talked about this uh, last week as as all the different needs and and desires and and opinions that um, that we have to weigh and that we hold on our shoulders. And yet we as school, as elected members of a public body answer to our community. Um, and, uh, you know, in the families that trust our district with her with their children's education. And I, I can't read those 31 pages of public comment and not feel like we're not doing what our community is asking us to do and asking us to step up and have the courage to, to find a, a solution and lead. Um, uh, and, and I also read impatience and frustration, the sense that, that we've been sitting back um, and sort of not being creative and not trying to figure out ways forward. Um, and it's unfortunate that, um, that it's now January. Um, I share all of those frustrations and that criticism is, is, is well, well grounded, I think. Um, uh, but I, I do agree um, that this is, it, it's tough. It's going to be a lot of work. I think we need to do this for our community. Um, Ms. Spitzer, your hands up. So I, I just wanna raise a couple concerns. Um, one is I'm worried that this is going to potentially have a really negative effect on the conversations we've been having with the APA. I'm, I'm, I don't have a crystal ball, but I'm worried that if we vote on this tonight, it might close down some of the conversations we've been having. Um, and I did hear loud and clear that they want us to work to, together. Um, so 
I'm concerned about that. I'm also concerned about the potential um, stress this is going to put on relationships between teachers and students. So we've been we've been the ones bearing the brunt of you know why not solely. I know people have been reaching out to um, to teachers um, directly too, but we've been bearing the brunt of the unhappy teacher. You know the unhappy parent who has been you know wants their kid in school, and I'm worried about the teacher who doesn't feel comfortable coming in. And then it becomes known because this is now a voluntary basis. And so say like, you know, Joey and the other class is in person now, but my kid's not in person and I'm putting pressure directly on, on my kid's teacher because I want to be in person. So I'm thinking like we need, I want to make sure that we can protect that person because I, I, I think this is a potentially a problematic and could really strain the relationship. Um, I guess I'm, I'm just, I'm worried this is gonna stop the conversation about the pre-K and the ILC students before it really even got off the ground. So I'm wondering, I don't know if there's a way to modify it to explicitly have it, since, since they've indicated that they're interested in those specific populations, if it would make sense to start off with that population in February and then if, see how the planning goes on those two populations and then come back and potentially have a new motion that would expand it um, to the next priority groups. Um, I think I'm in the minority here with kind of my feeling kind of cautious and anxious about making this move, but um, I just wanted to voice those concerns. Uh, Mr. Denlin. So I think those are very valid concerns. Um, so the, the end of the motion, um, the superintendent will work closely in collaboration with APA leadership. That's not just a throwaway line, right? And I don't honestly think that we could have put that in there prior to last week. And and I don't know if I would have. I don't I don't think it would be it would have been pragmatically effective to put it in had the APEA not um, come out last night um, approving um, voluntary return for pre K and ILC. You know they've. Um, you know I, I I give the APA a lot of credit for. Um, being um, the first public uh, organization for um, for supporting that voluntary return, um, and and uh, you know like like we've I think like every person has said in some degree there's a lot of implementation to be done here, a lot of details to be worked out, and um, the expectation you know the whole meaning of that last section there that talks about uh, engagement not only with APA leadership but also school committee and families. Um, is because the, the expectation is, isn't that the superintendent's going to go off into an isolated room and you know write up what he thinks is is the plan and then um, reveal it to everyone. You know, it's it's going to be um, you know uh, th those those details sh should be informed by those conversations and and I would expect that you know at our next and our subsequent meetings to the APA that would be a big part of it. Um, you know, my my concern with with starting just with pre K and ILC. Um, is that there are so many other um, subgroups that um, that really need attention. Uh, you know, we talk about highest need students, and certainly pre-K and ILC are included in that. Um, you know, we we also have ESP, PIP, Building Blocks, Ames, Connections, Summit Academy, uh, as well as you know the S Life students and beginning at ELL. These are all students that the district reached out. Um, to um, to leadership on uh, last October to try and get the ball rolling in co conversations about volunteer staff. Um, you know that was three months ago, um, and we have a, a conditional um, uh, thought of support um, for pre-K and ILC. That's that's definitely progress, but um, I th I think what it what it says to me is that that's that that's a, that's a long methodical process. And and we should we should continue that, and we should absolutely be implementing, um, and, and and keep in the spirit of uh, of respecting staff autonomy. I don't I don't think there's any getting around the fact that um, you know we can't control every person in the community's reaction, and we've certainly seen um, even with our current model, right? Parents and teachers and members of the public on occasion. Um, Acting inappropriately, <laughs> um, and I, I, you know, I, I, th I think the thing that we can do uh, to echo Mr. Harrington's comment as as leaders, as as people who are 
uh, elected and, and are trying to represent how we go about this is that we we continue with the respectful open communication and we absolutely you know respect the autonomy of, of what has been agreed to so far we, we obviously want to change the moa the school committee does that's very clear but we haven't been able to do that so we have we have what we have uh and and i think if the school committee expresses um that we are this is our pragmatic plan for right now and we are totally supportive of the right of teachers to uh continue to work remotely um at, and, and that is under the current moa sacrosanct and i think i think if we if we express that and and, and lead with that I, th I think that that can help uh achieve these these really needed benefits of in person for um for our students miss lord thank you i think i'm going to say a similar thing to mr demling but i really want to address that at times during the school year our school committee union rift as mimicked by the town has become quite polarized and in some ways we've um mirrored the national politics of vitriol um and i just want us to stop because i know we're better i know who we are i know that our teachers love our students and they want to be in person um i'm in support of this motion and i pray that parents and community let teachers have their autonomy. We don't know whose child is a cancer survivor or who has underlying conditions. So if there's a teacher that doesn't come back, I pray that we're all, or can I say pray? It's a, okay, I hope that we're all um, respectful of each other's story. We don't know each other's story. We don't have a right to know it. So if it's gonna be voluntary, I trust that we will let it be voluntary and not put any pressure on a teacher that it's really not feeling well, a teacher that cannot do it. Yeah, I just, yeah, I want to, I want us to listen to each other and hear each other and keep processing with our union thing, but I also am in support of this and honoring teachers that aren't volunteering. Thank you. So there's a um, um, couple folks that haven't spoken yet, and I want to make sure that before we, before anybody else speaks again, um, that you have an opportunity to speak. So um, Mr. Sullivan or Ms. Seeger. Yeah, I want just want to say, um, in full support of this, you know, we, we do have the same goals, but our timelines are so different. And we really do need to start, we're not talking about putting kids back in school next week. We're talking about trying to get them in when it's safe and that we just we need to start working on this because otherwise we could end up having middle schoolers or high schoolers go to school for a week in june and then they you know then we're looking at a new school year so we gotta we gotta start talking at least with ourselves now and get this thing rolling miss seeger I, I really appreciate the sentiments that Ms. Lord shared uh, about finding um, understanding for for a system where teachers may opt out um, and want to stay home. Um, I, I'm generally in support of this plan, and I do have the concern of it being a lot of work for Dr. Morris, but from everything I've seen so far in planning, um, I, I feel like he, he can work it out. He'll find balance in that between teachers who want to come back and teachers who may not. And how do you balance that between the student load and the teams, et cetera, et cetera. Um, although I do acknowledge that <laughs> it sounds like a lot of work. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm hopeful and especially with prioritizing the students that need to be in the schools the most that, that there will be a, a um, progression. This isn't a plan that has to be all put together at once. And, you know, it, it can be a process, an ongoing process. I, I don't know. But anyways, at any rate, I, I support this. There, Ms. Lord, your hand is uh, your little palm, it, but that's old. Okay. <laughs> um, does anybody have any further comments? Or are we ready to um, make that motion in the vote and take votes? No further discussion. Um, 
Uh, so I will share the motion again so folks can read it um, as, as, as I make the motion. Are you seeing the motion now? Google Meet doesn't show you, like put a little border or shiny border around what you're presenting. So I have no idea which, <laughs> which one it's showing, but good. Okay. Um, would somebody like to make a motion for the region? Or, or did we want to start with Amherst or Pelham first? I don't. Mr. Demling. I move that the Amherst School Committee directs the superintendent to develop and implement a plan for the return of in-person learning with staff who voluntarily choose in-person instruction for as many students as possible within the safety guidelines of public health officials starting in February and prioritizing higher need students. The superintendent will manage this return and any shift back to remote learning based on a continuous assessment of health conditions in direct consultation with local public health officials. The superintendent will work closely in collaboration with APEA leadership and gather input from the school committee and student families for safely to safely implement this plan. I'll second the motion moved by um, Demling and seconded by McDonald um, and we'll take a roll call vote of the Amherst School Committee. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Um, I, I think I'm gonna have to abstain. And um, McDonald, yes. So the motion passes four, um, uh, four yay, uh, zero uh, no, and one abstention. For Amherst, sorry. Would somebody like to make a motion for the region? I will make the motion if somebody else will second it. Um, I move that the regional school committee direct the superintendent to develop and implement a plan for the return of in-person learning with staff who voluntarily choose in-person instruction for as many students as possible within the safety guidelines of public health officials starting in February and prioritizing higher needs students. The superintendent will manage this return and any shift back to remote learning based on a continuous assessment of health conditions in direct consultation with local public health officials. The superintendent will, closely, will work closely in collaboration with APEA leadership and gather input, input from the school committee and student families to safely implement this plan. Is there a second? I'll second that. Moved by McDonald and seconded by Sullivan. We'll take a roll call vote of the region. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Abstain. Ms. Stancer. Abstain. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes seven, uh, six to zero with two abstentions. Chair Hall. All right, um, I'll move for Pelham that the school committee directs the superintendent to develop and implement a plan for the return of in-person learning with staff who voluntarily choose in-person instruction for as many students as possible within the safety guidelines of public health officials starting in February and prioritizing higher need students. The superintendent will manage this return and any shift back to remote learning based on a continuous assessment of health conditions in direct consultation with local public health officials. The superintendent will work closely in collaboration with APEA leadership and gather input from the school committee and student families to safely implement this plan. Is there a second? Second. All right, moved by Hall, seconded by Menino. We'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Barlow. Barlow. Yes. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. Ms. Stancer? Abstain. And Hall, aye. So the motion passes three to zero with one abstention. Uh, 
Okay. I can stop presenting. Thank you. Um, we now move on to our next item, which is um, warrants. Um, and we have three committees here. So um, I believe I have one for the Amherst School Committee. I need to find it. Ms. Spitzer, I don't know if you have any for that. I have a few as well. I need to also bring them up. Just be a moment. I can go. I find mine's up. Um, I, Allison McDonald, authorized by my signature to payables um, for uh, payroll in the amount of $635,567.54. Dated uh, January 13th, 2021, and I signed this on January 8th, 2021. I can go now. If... Yep, go ahead. I, Carrie Spitzer, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $5,124.64 for the warrant dated. January 7th, 2021. This included general fund expenses of $5,124.64. And I signed this on January 7th, 2021. I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $66,983.24 for the warrant dated January 11th, 2021. This included general fund expenses of $37,231.01, revolving fund expenses of $9,750.60, and grant fund expenses of $15,264.29, and other funds in the amount of $4,737.34 for capital. I signed this on January 11th, 2021. That is all. Chair Hall, are there any for Pelham that you need? Uh, you know what, I have a bunch of them and we have a Pelham only meeting on Thursday. So given the time, I'll just, I'll wait on mine. Thank you. Um, and uh, next is gifts. And I don't believe we have any gifts this evening. Um, so I will move to adjourn the regional school committee. Is there a second? Second. And moved by McDonald, second by Stancer. There's no discussion. Um, roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger? Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, I. The region is adjourned. Chair Hall. All right, thanks. Um, I'll make a motion to adjourn the Pelham School Committee. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Stancer, and I'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Stancer. Stancer, I. Mr. Menino. Menino, I. Ms. Barlow. Barlow, I. And Hall, I. Pelham is adjourned. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Scheduled for Amherst topics, but uh, we did not receive any um, specific to Amherst. So we can move on to um, community forum planning. And I'm going to confess, I, I um, need a moment to um, pull up the document that I shared with you all. <laughs> And of course, I can't find it, but I will. I have the Google Doc, so I will do that. Um, so this, um, what we're talking about, there was a, um, just as a reminder for folks watching at home or for those of us that at this late hour, we've, we need a refresher. Um, we had, um, there was a gr group of citizens, or red residents of Amherst that um, submitted a, a, a petition under the uh, town charter, I forget the section of, that it is, but it's, it's um, a resident meeting, a resident open meeting, um, and requested us to do this, uh, requested the school committee 
to have a meeting um, on the absence of in-person learning. Um, what I shared as a draft is really um, really to, to have the conversation going, but as a proposal of how we um, might structure this, um, this forum. Um, and just as a note, I did review this with the, um, the, the primary petitioner. Um, and so this incorporates all of their um, input and, and ideas as well. Um, so just just to, I, I find it always helpful to just capture what are what are the objectives of the forum and so um, and again I, I, sh I reviewed this with the petitioner and this sort of aligns with what their expectations are for what we um, what the objectives of this forum will be so it's really to provide an opportunity for community members to voice their concerns and questions about the 2021 school year particularly with regard to the lack of in-person learning and to foster a shared understanding of the factors that are related um, to um, implementing in-person learning in the district during COVID, including, um, and there was in the, for those of you that ha have seen the petition, there's, there's a whole host of questions that were included in that, and they're sort of at the bottom of this page. Um, and I, I tried to bucket them into sort of big topical areas. So impacts of the extended period of distance learning on students, health and safety plans for in-person learning, phasing and timetable for returning to in-person learning, decision metrics framework in the MOA for in-person learning and budget impacts of extended distance learning and of a return to in-person learning. Um, the proposed format would be a two hour online forum. Um, and I talked to uh, Dr. Morris and I talked briefly earlier this week. It, actually, that was just yesterday, wasn't it? <laughs> it's like this week seems so long. Um, uh, that we can do this on Google Meet. One of the things um, that the petitioners really um, like hold dearly is is that um, it's a live comment um, uh, and live commentary presentation opportunity for um, resident participants as opposed to what we typically do with public comment right now, which is the pre-recorded comments or email. Um, and there is a way to do so with Google Meet. Um, we just need commenters to be able to sign up ahead of time so that they can have the correct link to be able to get into the Google Meet to be able to speak. Um, and then uh, uh, Dr. Morris would be able to uh, facilitate so that they're muted or unmuted as, as needed, depending on when, when their comment is up. Um, we're proposing January 28th, which is a Thursday. Um, for that, and then this is sort of roughly the flow. Um, there would be a brief norm setting, very brief presentation that sort of touches on what is known um, and what is uh, sort of just the common set of facts on, on sort of these big bucket areas where the, where the petitioners had questions. Um, and then the bulk of the time would really be in that community live, I called it presentations, it's really comments. Um, there would also be um, an, uh, an opportunity for a response to questions um, at the end of that. Um, and the petitioners also requested that we, that we have our public health director join. Um, and so I haven't yet extended the invitation, but so that would be the, that's why that's in italics is that potentially we would invite Emma, uh, Ms. Dragon, our public health director, to join to answer any questions that might be related specifically to community health and public health. So, um, thoughts or ideas on, um, on this format, um, a proposed format, and it is a draft, so even though it, it represents the input from the petitioner, I think I tried to highlight what the, what the key areas of interest were from their, from their perspective. Mr. Demling. Uh, so overall, I like the structure. Um, I appreciate you taking the, the time and effort to reach out to the primary petitioner. Um, you know, we want this reflective of what the request was. So this that's that's excellent. Um, I, I I like that combination. Um, that that three point combination you have out there. Um, you know, district presentation on topics above. Um, so we very recently passed a motion <laughs> that affects a lot of this. Um, and so uh, I'm imagining, given the timing, right, it's like, what, 16 days from now, um, there will be more information available and more questions that there will be 
uh, about about that implementation of voluntary return. And so, um, I, you know, I don't I don't think we need to just so decide what those slides are now. But I would I would imagine that the um, superintendent can um, contour that presentation to what is you know needs to most effectively be communicated. Um, if it if it's allowed within the town charter for, for this kind of thing, I don't know what the town charter says about it really. Um, it would be great to um, to ask uh, or invite the um, APEA board to um, leadership uh, to participate on the on the panel if, if they if they wanted. Um, you know, keep keep on that spirit of collaboration. I think would be uh, would be really good. And I, I love the fact that you have uh, Emma Dragon there. You know, as the the person to talk about the, the safety. So, um, but overall, I think it's a good plan. I should have noted, thank you. I should have noted also that I have a um, question out. The, the town council um, will, will, will also be invited to, um, to, to be present. And, I, and the question that we have right now is to what extent they'll be actually in, you know, the, the invited versus the viewers. Um, so that's uh, um, TBD. And we also will share this um, and publicize this with our, our colleagues in the region um, so that they also are aware if they want to um, sort of acknowledging that um, while, while our residents are residents of Amherst um, and there's two different districts, the request went to the Amherst School Committee, um, that our, our, our neighbors don't always make the same distinction between, um, between bodies about whether it's a secondary and elementary school question. So, um, that our, our colleagues from the region um, will be invited to, to view it as well. Any other thoughts? Um, I, think, I think that would be a question back to um, Dr. Morris and then probably not that one that um, I would expect or ask you to answer this evening, but I do think, so the, the point that Mr. Demling raised about the timing of it, given the motion, that the, the vote that we just had, um, uh, does, this, does this date work um, for um, having, having some of those answers and, or not, right? So I think we'll just wanna sort of think through that as well. Dr. Morris? Yeah, I don't think we'll have super clear, I mean, I don't think all will be resolved uh, in 16 days, um, you know, just to be very candid about it. And so I don't know if that matters or doesn't matter. And, and maybe that's a really good question to bring back to the petitioner, um, given the vote that, that, that the three bodies took tonight. Um, to get a sense of what works best because i think you know this is a community my understanding you know or i'm not it's my understanding i believe it's truth i like um is that it's a community driven petition so i think just if if uh that person who led the charge on this would feel differently on the timeline i think giving that person the opportunity to weigh in that would be my recommendation um so it's not really up to myself or the committee but really it's about what the purpose was yeah that's a great idea, and I, I think also, um, you know, this in the spirit of of you know ensuring and bringing all stakeholders to the table as we develop this plan, I think that also could be really useful to have it when before um, any any you know plan is 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 being rolled out, sort of to really hear sort of the ideas from the community on this. Okay, are there any other um, discussion? Ideas from um, any members? No. Great. So I will follow up with the um, with the primary petitioner to sort of ask that question about whether that date is still um, uh, amenable. So our next um, item is the um, Caminantis sibling policy. Um, this was sort of revisiting the, our current policy in light of some questions that have come from community members, families that are um, have, have students in with the Comandantes. Um, and that, uh, Dr. Morris? Yeah, I can just give you a sense of, of the, where, it, where I believe it's coming from is families who have kids that were in the first cohort of Comandantes who are uh, current first graders who don't live in the Fort River catchment area, 
Um, you know, I understand, uh, I'm not taking a position on it, but I understand their advocacy for younger siblings to be involved in the program. Um, I will give you my two cents, but I think that's the framing is we now have kids who are not at Fort River, uh, who are at Fort River, excuse me, solely because of Comandantes, and then could their young siblings join the program? And so, you know, I have two sort of competing viewpoints to be candid. So the first is as long as the Spanish number, Spanish speaking um, or multilingual um, population stays at the point we want it in terms of the monolingual English speaking population, I'm pretty open to that. Um, it's really, you know, for me, it's not an educational challenge. It's, it'll be a logistical challenge, but it's really about a community challenge that you, you all face. Uh, what I'm not willing to do is to dilute the percentage of Spanish speakers in the program, because I think that's both critical to the success of the program, as well as consistent with the aims of the program that we had at the beginning about why we started it. Um, I think the thing that I, you know, for you all to consider is if you open the door to siblings joining the same school as siblings who are part of a program, um, I think it's a broader conversation where you may want to think about special education. Uh, specialized programs and other things. I, I'm not going to weigh pro or against, you know, pro or, you know, for or against. Um, but I think if we're going to have a sibling policy based on program, I, I don't know how we cut the distinction between comandantes and specialized special education programs. Um, and then if we go down that road, there's some logistics and cost to it. And, you know, it's hard to quantify that because we don't know exactly how many people, but um you know i think that's where it gets interesting and i don't mean that to be flip like i mean it's actually like a really interesting question that this committee struggled with and sometimes before we had commandant days about how to manage the fact that for some families one sibling attending a school because of a specialized special special education program meant that the other sibling was not able to attend that school um so there's a lot of it's not a simple issue for me um i'm very empathetic to folks in the community who are advocating uh, around the commandantes, um, you know, as a parent of multiple kids, I think, you know, those of us who are can all identify that, you know, there might be some real interest in having kids be in the same elementary school for many families, not everyone, right? I'm not talking about special needs or anything. Some families are like, no, keep my kids apart. But for many families, uh, from a convenience viewpoint, from a pick up drop off viewpoint, if they're providing their own transportation, and just from a school climate and culture viewpoint, um, that's a real um, advantage. But I think I can't, you know, for me, I can't separate out this program from some of our other district programs that have students attending outside their catchment area. So to summarize, I'm really, I will be comfortable in the end as long as we're not diluting, uh, reducing the Spanish speaking um, or you know, Spanish language population. Um, but I think the broader context about students in programs writ large and siblings um, is one that does come with logistical challenges and, and then potentially financial challenges as well in terms of additional busing because our, our van seats are at a premium. Um, and so that doesn't apply as much to Comandantes, but it does to specialized programs. So it's messy. You know, I wish I could be here and just be like, oh, it's really clean and this is smooth. But I think my job is, is not to do that when it's authentically not clean and smooth. Um, so sorry to make things complicated. I was really quiet much of the night, if you have so, um. I have a question about how this, so how this would be or could be implemented if we were, if we were to do this, would that mean that um, potentially um, a, a non, um, non-primary or, or, you know, in the English speaking cohort um, of, but a Fort River, Fort River zone student in um, that is in English speaking that desires to be in the Caminantes program that they could potentially lose that seat to a student, an English speaking student from Wildwood or Crocker Farm. That's if true. So it does. Yeah, no, I'm glad you raised that. I meant to, and I apologize. It's late. Um, I was up early. Um, you know that that's the other political complication. You know, and practical complication is, you know, it, it means that. You know, the first two years, we were pretty much able to support every Fort River monolingual English speaking student who wanted to be part of the program to be part of the program. I think two or three years ago, so Mr. Demling, you may have been, are you the longest serving member of the Amherst Committee now, Mr. Demling? Uh, yeah. 
I think, so you may be the, I, I may have said it enough years ago where you may be the only person who was here when I said it, but one of the pieces of feedback that Ms. Richardson and I got was a caution on sibling policies, um, mostly because districts uh, utilized them or were pressured to utilize them to reduce the number of native or speakers of whatever the language the program was in. So I think that's not so much a challenge, and I don't think this will be a challenge on the sibling front for a little while, but as the program matures and there's more and more younger siblings, um, it could end up being, you know, if we have 20 English speaking spots and 10 go to siblings at some point in the future, that certainly wouldn't happen next year. Then you're talking about half the program being sort of closed for the Fort River population. So that's why I say it's not easy. Like I wish from the parent point of view, I absolutely empathize. I want to be really clear about the desire to do that. I'm not opposed to it in, in principle. I think the practical realities are, are unfortunately a little more complicated yeah. to sort through and they're not so complicated for next year again i don't i don't know the number of siblings but i imagine it's it's very low just based on a number of we haven't had that many non-fort river kids monolingual kids in the program um but the concern is just over time how that goes um so you know i think you know there's a number of different ways we could think about this um you know we could try it for a year and, or cap the number of siblings we accept in the program and have their own separate lottery we've, we've as it's, it was in the packet but you know we have our four groups we could make a fifth group if we wanted to make a a, a fifth group or something along those uh, lines but i just want to make sure we're tracking this over time to make sure if, if the committee wants to change the policy that way to make sure that we're not making it a closed program that that's that's personally my my concern is because then, then it becomes an equity issue because it's no longer sort of um it's sort of it's it, it, the, the idea of a closed and exclusive access to to a program sort of uh, in a public school makes it um challenging for me and i i grew up um with a with a sister who um was in special ed and went to a different school um, than i did so i i know what it feels like and i know how challenging that is both um for the family as well as for the students so i i really empathize with with that situation I, I think i'd be open to five and having a separate sibling <laughs> sibling lottery or is there a way that we could put a, a cap on it like a fuse that says once we get to this this you know this number um then then we we move to a lottery right so um a separate lottery or, or some but that starts to make it super super complicated and i don't know how we do that so i saw mr demling's hand and then Ms. spitzer's hand so um We'll go Dem uh, Demley and then Spitzer. Yeah, so um, I appreciate this conversation. There are like three or four points that both Dr. Morris and Ms. McDonald have brought up that I have not considered. Given that it's 920, my preference is not to vote on this tonight. Um, I would like to bring it back uh, and uh, digest these, these, um, these points. Um, may maybe with the ability to um, email Ms. Richardson if she's available to it to kind of talk through it. Um, I, I find myself coming at this from an interesting point of view. So I was um, uh, a Crocker Farm parent uh, and I was a Wildwood parent. So, so I was zoned, I am still currently zoned Crocker Farm, <laughs> but I don't have any more kids going there. Um, and my oldest son uh, went to Wildwood because he was part of the ILC program uh, for intensive special needs. And you know, I really appreciate the services he got there but that was hard, <laughs> you know? Um, and, uh, you know, this, this obviously came up when we were looking at the building project a number of years ago. Um, so, so I understand the strain that it puts on families. Um, and I'm, as, and as someone who went through that, I'm not particularly compelled by the line of thinking that because we don't offer sibling programs in these other programs that we then therefore shouldn't offer it in, in Caminantes. I feel like, Caminante should be evaluated for what Caminante is and, and what we're trying to do. And there are some subtle differences here, right? Um, you know, Caminante is an, is an opt-in program uh, fully, right? Now, now, technically, so is ILC, but not really. Like, that's where my kid really ought to have gone if he wanted to get the, the services he needed. Um, you know, so it wasn't, wasn't really much of a choice. Um, I, I do find some of the arguments that uh, we got from the community member who sent us this issue compelling about um, when uh, about the benefit to the program and to the students in the program when there are siblings in the program. Um, I won't go through all the, the uh, information they cited, but they did make a, a decent case for 
um, you know, how it increases parent engagement and having two students in the same house that are, are going through that immersion um, setting. Um, I completely agree with Dr. Morris's first point that we don't want to dilute the um, Spanish speaking population. So if we had a prioritization adjustment here, I, I, from my point of view it would have to be within the, the language groups, um, you know, not, not crossing that, that boundary. Um, you know, I've spoken about this before about some other changes that I, I think we should do. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't think it's simple. Um, and I would like to digest some of this new stuff that I heard tonight in order to make a, um, a more informed decision. Ms. Spitzer. I agree with Mr. Dumling. It's been a long night and it would be nice not to have to make this decision tonight, but I, I guess I'm just not inclined to change the policy given that we said the we were very clearly communicating the policy prior to anybody opting to enroll in the program. You know, we, we had a very clear policy and I'm a little concerned just, I think there are so few seats available to those um, who are not within the Fort River District that to put, um, essentially take more of those seats off the table feels, I, I just, it feels like it's gonna make things a lot more complicated and potentially the, the other third thing that we haven't talked about and it feels a little bit like getting really far ahead of ourselves, but I'm just gonna put it out there because I've been thinking about it is the, um, is the building project. And so if we end up, either one of these options is gonna have huge impacts on the common access program, but if we create this sibling policy, and I know that, you know, like you said this earlier, 2025 is the year we're looking at, but I could see people who are currently in the program having siblings who start in 2025. So are we potentially putting, locking ourselves into something that's going to have an impact down the road when we're looking at, um, at a new building. So again, I, I also feel like I'm not quite there yet with making a final decision, but I think it's worth um, just keeping that in mind as we as we move forward. I, I like the suggestion to sort of marinate a little bit longer and and come, and maybe um, and and we come back at our at our next meeting to to vote. I was just looking just to make sure that we're not. That the lottery wouldn't be starting before then, and looks like it wouldn't even start until March or April. So, yeah. So we have we have time. Um, yeah, I, I think that with a with a new building, the entire policy probably would need to be relooked at because of a consolidated school or even a smaller school. So we don't we don't even know if we're you know we we just don't know the impacts of that new school building. So we it's very likely that it will need to be relooked re at. Um, okay. Um, Ms. Lord or Mr. Harrington, did you want to add anything to the to the conversation? Nope. Okay. So I move to adjourn the Amherst School Committee. <laughs> I was going to say item seventeen. Um, I second. Um, moved by Spitzer, seconded by McDonald. Um, and um, no discussion. So, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The Amherst School Committee is adjourned. Thank you.